one more chapter. I hope you're all well and staying safe at this time. Thank you so much for joining us today for an extra special live video presentation. In association with the Romantic Novelists Association, Charlotte Ledger will be giving us all a fantastic presentation on the current state of romance publishing and will then be available to answer all your questions live and help you out with her expert advice. Charlotte has won the RNA Publisher of the Year twice and she is now the editorial director of One More Chapter, a division of HarperCollins Publishers. Last year, Charlotte did a version of this presentation at the RNA Summer Conference. So it's brilliant that she's able to present an updated version to everyone again this year, especially in light of the current circumstances. So first of all, we'll go through the presentation, but please do comment away all your questions as we go through, and then we'll answer them, answer them at the end of Charlotte's talk. Uh, and please do tag anyone else now that you think wouldn't want to miss this opportunity because we're gonna get started shortly. Um, so for now, please help me in welcoming Charlotte. Hello, Charlotte. Hi, Mel, hi everyone. Hi, how are you doing? Uh, good. Um, I'm a bit hay fevery today. Well, oh. I say a bit. I'm actually quite a lot hay fevery. So yeah. I'm sorry if I'm sniffing or I sneeze on camera, everyone. Um, <laughs> uh, summer. <laughs> sure, I know, I know, and I got this like a BBC alert or something today saying that um, hay fevers come early and how to deal oh. with it. Um, is anyone else suffering from hay fever out there? Let us know. We're both. It's yeah. the bane of my life at the moment. <laughs> um, but I hope everyone is staying well and safe still. And thank you so much for tuning in and spending your lunch with us. Yes, um, it's quite it's quite daunting because usually we have our amazing authors. Mm. That, like, yeah, I know. Is that right? And then now it's yeah. just me. Yeah, so. now it's just you. So we're, we're excited. Um, lots of people I, commenting. So hello, everyone. Glad that you're oh, all with us. Hi, everyone. I really hope this is um, interesting for everyone. Yeah, uh, it will is, be. Well, I don't know. Some people might be like, oh, it's really? just waffling on. I can oh. ramble. Um, and also it's so this is a presentation I did at the RNA conference last summer. Um, so it is sort of tailored towards the romance market. However, authors who are writing other genres might find something useful in here, too. Um, and really, it was just just something I wanted to do um, to kind of make sure authors are as informed as they can be, because there are so many options um, yeah. out there for new writers. Uh, there are so many uh, like decisions to make, so many publishers, so many imprints, so many different models. Um, so I just, I thought it would be like, I just wanted to give a bit of a look at what publishing um, was like at the moment or what I think it's like at the moment. And um, yeah, unfortunately the RNA uh, summer conference this year was canceled. Although I think they're also doing an online one. Um, yeah. which is amazing so sign up for that and if you don't know what the rna is it's the uh Roma romantic novelist association um they're a group of wonderful wonderful authors and writers who are really supportive of new people coming into the industry um as well as you know people who've published 10 books or so um and they're a really lovely community yeah. um yeah, so, they're amazing. They're so much fun. Yeah, and, and the party because yeah. normally there are so many fun parties. Yeah, sure the there parties are, many people are, out there the parties are great themselves. fun. Um, yeah. So I think I don't know. Should we get and started? Now, yeah, let's get let's okay. get started. So, um, like, I'll, I'm going to disappear myself away for now, everyone, yeah. and I will be bringing up Charlotte's presentation. So here we go. So just bear in mind. This was last year. Um, I had a look back through and I do think some of it's still relevant. Um, it's it's sort of my take, as I've put in my um, in the title, an insight into the changing landscape of romance publishing. Um, but as I've said already, this could also there could be some things in this uh, that might be useful for people who aren't writing romance as well. So, um, yeah, so. Uh, my name is Charlotte Ledger, if you don't know me. Um, I'm editorial director of One More Chapter at HarperCollins. And this slide is all about why I'm qualified to talk about this subject. Um, 
I definitely, definitely get imposter syndrome. Uh, it's taken a, quite a few years for me to realise that actually I do have experience <laughs> and some of my thoughts and some of my um, sort of knowledge could be useful to share with everyone. Before now, I sort of was like, oh no, don't don't speak up, don't say this, um, what do you know, kind of thing. That, ho that horrible attitude that I know a lot of people share. Um, and while I was thinking about what, if I was a, this all, this presentation came from me thinking, okay, what, if I was going to write a book and get into publishing, what would I want to know? And it also came from me kind of having a few experiences with different authors, different agents, different publishers, where I sort of questioned why they were making decisions and um, why I, it just felt like sometimes they didn't have all the information before they made a decision and I really feel passionately sorry there's a there's a fly um I really feel passionately that authors should be as informed as possible so you can control your career and you know you have as much information to make the right decisions for you and your books um so why I'm qualified uh, as Mel said I was RNA publisher of the year um twice which is insane and I still can't believe it uh, thank you so much to everyone who voted and nominated me um, but I actually I, the RNA is very close to my heart because I started in publishing um, in 2011 at Mills and Boone uh, and had the best two years there and I learned so much about editing and storytelling um, you really when an author writes so Mills and Boone books are 50,000 words on the whole, um, which is a lot shorter than your average full length novel. And when you write that short, when you write that word count, you really have to make sure every word you write counts. Every plot twist is pushing the story forward. Every bit of dialogue is interesting and keeping the reader hooked. Um, and to be able to have that hands-on editing experience and work with some amazing writers and authors really, really um, helped shape my editorial career. So I had two years there and then I moved over to HarperCollins and I helped set up uh, Harper Impulse, which is a which was um, a digital first imprint. So digital first means you publish the ebook first and you're able to test and see what works in the ebook market before necessarily committing to a physical book. And I'll go into that a bit later. So I set up Harper Impulse um, after a few years. I then worked very closely with the Killer Reads team and oversaw that. And then last year, we created One More Chapter really excitingly. And how One More Chapter is different is that it's a whole new division. Um, so it's not just an imprint attached to a division, say Harper Fiction. It's a division in its own right. And we have our own dedicated editorial team. We have our own dedicated marketing team. And we are committed to, you know, the best storytelling, really commercial reads and finding new ways to publish and explore all opportunities. Um, so I've been I've been in digital for eight years, I think now. Um, I'm really like right at the beginning uh, of digital. When I when I first started at HarperCollins, I had no idea what metadata was. I won't be afraid to say that. And in fact, actually, the metadata could we could only change the metadata on a Sunday night. That was the only time you could update the copy. So the metadata, if for anyone who doesn't know, is all the bits about the book that go into the Amazon product page and description um, so we could only change that once a week so if I perhaps made a typo um, it would then be stuck there for a week until Sunday when we pushed it again um, we couldn't use bold or italics in our copy on Amazon um, it was you know it was very 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 different and very much at the early stages. And over the eight years I've been at HarperCollins, um, it, 
it's just grown incredibly and I'm I love digital and I think there are so many opportunities however I also do have experience of traditional publishing so I've got experience of the Mills and Boom model which is again quite different I've got experience of digital publishing and I've got experience of uh, what we'd call traditional publishing on the half fiction list. And I've worked with amazing authors um, across all the lists, all the companies, just incredible authors um, on fiction, working with Carmel Harrington, who um, started off on Harper Impulse. Um, but then we, because she's an Irish author, she has an incredible platform in Ireland and we could see a retail opportunity in Ireland. So we, she's on the Harper Fiction list now and she's an Irish Times bestseller. Um, Debbie Johnson, her Comfort Food Cafe series has sold over a million copies, which still just, I can't get my head around. Um, it's incredible. Uh, I've also worked with Joe Heap, um, who are very different, uh, very different author writes really beautiful commercial literary books that I've done in hardback. Um, and I also this year published The Women at Hitless Table, which was actually first written in Italian. And then I took on the English translation and published it here in the UK again in hardback. So I've worked across all formats, uh, all divisions, all imprints. So not really in a nutshell because I rambled a bit I'm sorry um, but that's why I feel I've got some experience to talk about what I'm going to talk about today so next slide please Mel uh, yes so I am also addicted to romance um, in every form tv film books uh, and this was a slide showing the books that I read growing up that I just adored and like l loved them so Katie Ford was the first I think outside of what I was reading at school um Katie Ford was the first author I read when I was about 14 um and I love The Rose Revived if you haven't read it it's a wonderful wonderful book about um three 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 women who come together um because they're looking for jobs they end up working for a really dodgy cleaning company with a horrible boss and then they decide to create their own company and their own business um, um one of the they all have an amazing love interest as well um one of them ends up uh having christmas at this farm with a gorgeous irish wolfhound and an equally gorgeous owner um and one of them lives on a canal boat um and it just it just really showed to me like just how like that really lovely, wonderful, uplifting feeling you get from romance. Um, Fiona Walker as well was a big, big, big fat, like I'm a big fan of hers. Um, Jenny Colgan talking to Addison, um, Audrey Howard. These are just an example of the, the books I was reading um, and I still read today. So I'm a huge, huge fan of romance. And then next slide. Uh, yes, yeah, so first of my top tips, um, number one. So this is, I've said, find an editor who's passionate about the genre you're writing. So there are loads of editors, um, loads of publishers, and you can almost, I'm sure it's very overwhelming as an author, like you're thinking, where do I even start? But one thing I think is really important is that your editor actually like loves and is passionate about the books you write and the genre you write. And that might sound a bit like, well, of course they're going to be, but some editors do have a natural, my passion is definitely romance. I work across crime and thriller as well, but, um, and I really enjoy crime and thriller books. I really enjoy literary books. Um, I love Margaret Atwood. However, I also would be useless at sort of editing, I'd say Hilary Mantel. I wouldn't know where to start. So for me, it's about finding an editor who like just has that passion and also that instinct. If they've been reading that genre or that type of book that you're writing, then they'll have the instincts in the terms of the editorial and the storytelling, in terms of how they publish, um, everything. So what I really want to encourage you to do is like do your research on your editors. Um, we're all on Twitter on the whole. You can really see a person's personality, I think, and their likes and tastes on Twitter. Speak to us, DM, you know, message us on Twitter, find out more about us. Um, and really just sort of 
get to know the editor as much as you can um, before you ever decide to work with them is one of my one of my top tips um, because everybody you know publishing it is a business everybody wants the next big book everybody wants um, to make a success uh, but really for me what I've learned from my relationships with my authors are if you have this you know if you love what you're if you love what your author is writing it just comes a bit more naturally to you too and it's a great place to start that author editor relationship uh yes and then this is what i really really want authors and writers both to think about is you are the author of your own career so I also heard, I think it was um, Bella Forrest did this amazing, she's a huge self-published author in the US. She's done incredibly well. Um, and I think it was her, although I'm really sorry if I'm misquoting her, that said like, be the CEO of your own career. Um, or she could have heard it from, she could have got that from someone else. It's probably a really famous quote. <laughs> but basically you are in control of your writing career. So. Don't ever think you're dependent on publishers, agents, who read, you know, whoever else. That what I really want you to feel is that power and that ownership, and um, like go out there, explore every option, and make sure you're as informed as you can be before you decide on which way your career is going to go. Okay. Uh, so going back back to basics, how publishing used to be, you'd write a book, uh, you'd then find an agent by posting, you know, sending out letters, um, and you'd then hopefully get a deal through an agent and you'd be published. Uh, it was, and it was pretty straightforward. That's kind of how it was. There weren't really that many other options. A lot of publishers wouldn't accept anything from anyone who didn't have an agent. Um, yeah, so it was really straightforward. And the next slide, please, Mel. And now is a very, very different landscape. So there are lots of different opportunities. <laughs> there is self-publishing. So you write a book, you decide you want to write a book, you have your story, you write a book. You can then go into so many different avenues of publishing now. It's amazing. I just think it's incredible the opportunities there are for writers. So you can go into self-publishing, you can go find an agent, you can go to a digital publisher, you can actually do all of that and swap and mix it up and you can self-publish and then find an agent. You can self-publish and then get a publishing deal. You could get a publishing deal and then self-publish. Um, you could work, you could go write for Amazon's imprints as well, um, which again is another slightly different model. There are so many, so many different avenues that you can take. And for me, I really feel strongly that before you can decide what opportunity you want to take you should know about each of these different areas so that's what I'm hoping to talk about today as well to talk you through the kind of different models um, it's also really important sorry I love the notebook any excuse to put a notebook gif in it's also really important to think about what you really want as an author so what is your what are your goals for your career do you want to make lots and lots of money? Obviously, that would be nice. Uh, do you want a really long career and, you know, be writing for 30, 40 years? Uh, do you want prestige? Do you want to be, you know, do you want to be on a long list for the Booker Prize or, you know, do you want to win prizes? Um, do you want to see your book on a shelf? Do you want to see, is it because you just love writing books and you feel you need to do it and writing is the most important thing or is it about the reader reviews and um, like having that feedback from people who love who love what you do what is it that's actually going to motivate you in your career so that's something really important to think about because this is then going to influence all your decisions and I also feel that no editor or agent can tell you this it really is about you and what is going to make you tick. And not all of these come with a publishing deal 
or with how you publish. So for instance, you could win prizes and prestige, but you might not have many sales. You could get loads and loads and loads of sales. You could make millions, but then not actually see your book on a shelf. Um, you could get incredible editorial support if you want help with the storytelling process from an editor and an agent, or you maybe don't like the idea of anyone touching your work. It, it like nothing is you don't get, or it's very rare, I'd say, that you get all, all of this in one. And it's sort of thinking about what your priorities are, what you would really like to achieve. And it's not that you have to kind of pick and choose. It could be that you put that in an order of most importance to you. So you think, okay, for the first year, first few years, I want to hit uh, a lot of sales. And then maybe I'll, you know, I can then focus on perhaps getting a book on a supermarket shelf. Um, it's just something you really need to think about again before you make your decisions. Uh, so next, I am going to take you through the different models. Um, as I've said, I've worked across most of them. Um, and I just, again, it's really about you being as informed as possible. So you know what you're getting when you're signing a deal in any of these areas. So the one I'm starting with is the traditional traditional publishing. Um, it is, you know, the big five, uh, HarperCollins, Hachette, PRH, s and uh, It means you get an advance up front plus royalties and you start to earn your royalties uh, once you've earned out your advance. You get six monthly royalty statements. So you'll find out how much you're earning every six months. Um, you usually have to have an agent. However, like look around, there will be some imprints that do open submissions. And I think actually one of the great things that's happening in publishing at the moment is that there is more, um, there's more scope for, you know, we're not just having to go through agents. Uh, but I would still say if you're looking for what I guess what they call a big deal, it is really important you have an agent. Um, acquisitions meeting. So that means when an editor loves your book, if they feel it has an audience, if they feel it's going to sell um, and they have a vision for your book, they'll take it to the acquisitions team, uh, the acquisitions meeting. And that's made up of sales, marketing, publicity, the executive editors, the publishers, and every single one of those people has to buy into your book and that editor's vision for the book. So every person has to agree that this is a book to buy. And that can be, as an editor, that can be a tough meeting because not everyone will agree with you. Um, and it's a tough, it's tough to get books through, especially at the moment. Um, we're seeing, obviously, even this year, I mean, when I was say when I was presenting this last year, there's it was a tough, it was a challenging publishing environment. Um, you know, retail slots were reducing, um, supermarkets were weren't really taking as many books as they used to. Uh, it it just it can be really hard um, to get that buy-in. And remember, a publisher is still a business, so there has to be you are still wanting, you know, you do need to make money. So you have to be really sure of a book when you take it to your acquisitions meeting. Um, in terms of the team, it's usually a very large, very experienced and traditional publishing team behind you. Um, as I've mentioned them already, sales, marketing, publicity, um, and they'll have, they'll work on, you know, this, the wealth of experience in publishers is incredible. Um, Sort of last year, year before, if I'd done this presentation, I would have said with a traditional publishing deal, you would get retail. That would be guaranteed. Um, that's all changed now, as I've touched on. Actually, retail isn't guaranteed anymore. It really does depend on what the like how many slots if we're looking at supermarkets, which is um, probably the biggest channel for commercial and romance, you know, commercial fiction. Um, you're looking at what slots the supermarkets are offering, how many they have, is there room for the amount of books that we're also publishing? 
um, what and also how many books are readers buying now as well and where are they buying them um, the, it, it you don't buy a book if you don't think it's going to get into retail but what I'm saying is it's just a much harder it's much harder now so you, it's really difficult to guarantee that you're going to see a book on a on a supermarket shelf these days um there's usually a much longer submission publication uh journey um so one year i mean other input like if you say digital you can publish a book really quickly if you need to um usually in traditional publishing you need a much longer lead in time and that's because there's so much to like make the trade aware um talk to all the right people um get word of mouth going reviews all sorts of things so it does take a bit longer um higher prices now this tends to be with um sort of the ebook model you tend to have a higher pre-order price as well or that used to be the case um with as opposed well I'll come on to that when i speak about digital so you'd usually see your books at like 2.99 and above um starting in digital and then if you got a promotion they would then drop down to 99p and then as i said it's usually agented as well now i know it's really hard to find an agent um and that is changing in traditional publishing uh, but on the whole, what an agent can do, you do send, tend to see the slightly bigger deals if an agent is negotiating the terms for you as opposed to you doing it yourself. We can come on to that in a bit. So next slide. Uh, top tip number two. Oh, yes. Yeah, so if you're looking at traditional publishing, um, again, one of the things I'd recommend you do if you've been offered a traditional publishing deal or you want to target a traditional publishing deal and you're looking at the different imprints, the different lists, the different publishers, um, look at what else they're publishing. So as we've talked about, space is reducing quite significantly at the moment. Um, and what you what it's good to be aware of is who are the other authors that publisher is already publishing and where will you fit into that? So, you know, some or some some publishers have massive brands that, of course, take a lot of work, a lot of energy, a lot of focus because they are huge, big brands. Where will you fit in with that? Um, have they got four other authors who are already writing in the same area? Does that mean you're going to end up competing with those four other authors as well internally? as as well as in the market um, as an editor some of the time I find I can find books I absolutely love and I still have to turn down because I already have books similar or a book similar to that that in publishing and what I don't want to do is split the focus between two very similar books um, it's really, really hard to turn down those books because you love them, but ultimately that's for the best. That's the best for the author. Um, so really look at what the list as a whole. Who are they publishing? Um, the example there is sometimes you can be a little fish in a big pond, and that might suit you, or you'd rather be a big fish in a little pond. Okay, next slide. Uh, digital first. So. Um, oh, one thing I'm just going to mention on traditional publishing, I mentioned the big five, but really importantly, that it's not just the big five. There are lots of brilliant independent publishing houses too that are traditionally publishing like Head of Zeus, um, One World, etc. So don't just think it's the big five and that's it. There are other opportunities within there and indie publishers can do amazing. Like they, they'll have a different... It will just again be about what suits you. They'll they'll have different ways of doing things, but always bear in mind every like every publishing house. Um, so digital first. Uh, this includes one more chapter, um, along with some other amazing competitors uh, that I'm sure you've all heard of. And what I really want to stress about this is digital first does not mean digital only. So I always hear from authors, agents well i like the sound of it but i don't want my book to just be an ebook and i'm like well it's not an ebook so 
on one more chapter every book we publish has a print edition as well so like it's not digital first really does mean digital first there are digital only lists um and you know make sure you you're aware of that but don't think if the word digital is in there that you're not going to get a chance to see your book in physical if that's what you really want so how is a digital first different to traditional publishing um there's no advance but we do offer a higher digital royalty so we don't offer money up front but what you do get instead is the ebook royalty is higher because that's where we expect the majority of sales to come from and so that should benefit you more than say having the money up front uh, you get monthly statements um, which some authors might prefer as well so you can really see what you're earning each month um, and you can you can sort of compare you can look at the sales closely see if it's gone down if they've gone up um, and think about kind of why that is uh, social media digital marketing experts so particularly on the marketing front um, digital marketing is very different to traditional marketing where you sort of deal with outdoor campaigns um, you know posters in the train stations for instance um, digital marketing on a digital first list is very very like it really is focused on the digital it's about growing an online community it's about reaching out to readers um, it's using Facebook ads, um, targeting those readers, analyzing the data. And it's not to say that this doesn't happen on a traditional marketing campaign. It does. Um, but the focus is really, you know, sometimes on a traditional marketing campaign, the focus is on like the author as opposed to the community. Or, you know, you work up to publication date as well. Publication date is kind of like the main um that's like the big date to go on. So you build all your work up to publication date, whereas actually with digital, I'd say it's almost the other way around. Public pub date is just the beginning and you need to keep engaging with your readers after that. Um, we do tend to have a larger list of authors. Uh, that doesn't mean it's there's any less sort of care or attention. Um, it's just we can publish more books more quickly because we're more flexible and agile um, in a way that we don't quite have all the same processes as in traditional publishing. So going through all the kind of levels of approval so much, um, the production process itself in traditional publishing, obviously you're doing a print book first, so that takes longer than creating an ebook, and um, all of those things to consider. So it can be quicker and can be more reactive. Um, it's very much I think this is in the last year this lower strategic pricing does really cover the other models as well but it used to be that debuts or you know sort of less well-known authors could would be launched at 99p but now you're really seeing more and more a lot of the bigger brands at 99p um, that's usually through promotions though it's very very rare that you would get one of those books at 99p from the beginning um, but it, definitely in digital it was the 99p ebook where you could drive visibility um, world or language rights usually so we asked for it one more chapter world or language rights and this means that we have the rights to sell your book in lots of different territories um, and for us we do that through our amazing HarperCollins international rights team who I want to give a shout out to you because they really have done incredible work with our authors and our lists. Um, we've sold in over I think 11 countries now or 11 languages. Um, Ju Julie Kaplan was a bestseller in Germany the other day, um, Jane Linfort's a German bestseller, like it's it, our team we can really um, if you, especially if you don't have an agent and you don't have those contacts with foreign publishers, your publisher can then sell your rights for you and make those contacts for you. But we don't just have to have world or language either. Um, we will also look at world English language, which means North America, the US. Um, and 
Uh, I've just seen Rhoda actually. Sorry, we weren't going to do questions afterwards. Rhoda says sometimes digital first is ebook only, but only if the ebooks don't sell as well as expected. Um, I can only speak from my HarperCollins experience and one more chapter, one more chapter, every single book gets a paperback. We don't look at the sales. There's a paperback that usually comes two months afterwards. It can come later, it can come before that. We'll look at when the best date is, but there will always be a paperback and it's sold through Amazon online, you know, retailers online, Amazon Waterstones. Um, they can be ordered into bookshops. And um, so, yeah, so other publishers, it might be other digital first publishers, it might only be digital only. Um, but just to stress with one more chapter, every book we do has a physical edition as well. Um, digital first, you can also be agented and un unagented. Um, it used to be that we had our open submissions box, uh, which is an amazing place for finding new talent. It's um, that's how we started. And then more, we now work with more agents too. So you can have an agent and you can't have an agent. You know, it's not, you don't have to have an agent. And then, yeah, as I said, digital first does not mean digital only and no problem, Rhoda. Um, so that's digital first very quickly. Uh, top tip number three. Oh, yeah. So this this came up last year because I was seeing a number of um, digital publishers just set up and they'll be like, oh, we're digital publishers. Submit to us. And I was also like, well, look at who is creating. It could be they've got amazing experience. Absolutely. Um, but also just just be aware of who is behind the scenes and who is running it. And also, again, like your like the editor tip before, like really kind of think about like, OK, what how are they? What experience do they have in publishing books, in digital, in the genre I'm writing in? Um, like, yeah, what is their experience? What's their passion? So just be careful in case I don't I don't know if this is a thing, but you could get people sit, setting up digital publishers and it's not really the, you're entrusting them with your book. So I guess what I'm saying here is make sure you really trust them. Um, yes, so next slide, Mel. Uh, Amazon imprints. So this is one I've put on its own. Um, I don't know massive amounts about it, um, but everybody knows that Amazon does have its own publishing lists and they do brilliantly. So it's really growing. Um, they do fantastic books. Um, so from what I've heard and researched, you do have to have an agent. Uh, although anyone from Amazon, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it's global. Amazon is a massive global company. Uh, they have access to Audible for ebooks, um, sorry, for audio. Um, they've got Amazon Prime Studios. Uh, they could work closely with them. Uh, I haven't, I don't know much about their retail strategy, I'm afraid. Um, so I don't know if, like what the retail looks like. So if you, if you wrote for Amazon, do you then get a book? In a supermarket, I'm not really sure. Um, they offer advances plus royalties, like traditional publishing. Um, but what they're amazing at, I mean, they are so good at the data and they can get books to the top of the Kindle charts. They have incredible um, like insights on who readers are and huge mailing lists. Um, so, and they just have, you know, they there's, there's so many advantages to working there as well. So I hope basically as I'm going through these models, I'm really hoping you can see like the the points, like each one is actually quite different and it will, it's about what you want and what will appeal to you and what will make you happy in terms of your publishing journey. Um, they also have fantastic editors at Amazon who I know. And yeah, they're just, it's really interesting to see what they're they're doing. So if you want absolute ebook success and you want to be top of the Kindle charts, uh, Amazon are obviously the experts in that. And then moving on, we have self-publishing, um, which has such a, like, it definitely has an unfair reputation. Um, Self-publishing can sometimes be seen, well, digital publishing as well, if I'm honest, can kind of be looked down upon 
by the wider industry and it's really unfair because there are some um, there are there are incredible authors publishing self publishing themselves um like LJ Ross is just she is like I'm such a fan girl um she's just done amazing things and I you know she's really a good example to look up to but there's so many other examples as well and what you can get through self-publishing is that you know that total control so you'll get through um you know you'll get unrivaled sales data because Amazon have that data on the readers they don't give that out um they you know they keep it in house and it's incredible the kind of reading habits when people stop read you know how long it takes for someone to stop reading a book all you accept there's so much data it's amazing um and you as a self-published author do you get ac access to that um they gl it's global again you can publish everywhere uh you'll make money i've put royalties here but i'm guessing i'm not entirely sure how it works actually you obviously have a cut you you're selling your book and obviously amazon will take a cut um oh someone's mentioned nicola may yes corner shop in cockleberry bay incredible it's number one for ages um self-publishing as well you're the author the publisher the cover designer the marketeer the publicist you kind of do everything so that can be a good thing that can also be a bit exhausting or draining for some people however more and more there are more and more, um, what's the word? Oh, I can't think of the word, companies being set up. So um, I'm gonna just shout out to Books Covered, Stu and Natasha and the other designers there. They are incredible designers that are there to, if you need a cover, go to them. Um, oh, Lindsay, thank you. 70% royalties with Amazon eBooks, far more, um, than you'd get on other con contracts. Uh, but yeah, back to the kind of, yes, you need to be a cover designer, but actually you now have access to incredible cover designers. Stu and Tash worked in traditional publishing, but they also, they've now been, I think, how long has Books Covered been running for? I'm really sorry, I can't remember, Stu. Um, they just have amazing experience and work, you know, work with many digital authors and self-published authors. Um, really good quality designers and there are other people out there as well. They're amazing quality editors, um, Emily Rustin and Jenny Hutton. Um, I'm now, I shouldn't start naming names because I forget people and I'm really sorry if I mentioned you, but basically the resources out there now for self-publishing authors, there's, there's just, it's amazing. Um, and I don't think it should be seen as anything less. Uh, and yes, the potential to sell millions, millions and millions, and you have the Amazon platform and their marketing services. So there are good, you know, it's every, again, as I've said already, like every model is gonna have a, I don't wanna say pros and cons, cause it means like there's negatives and I don't wanna talk about negatives, but it's basically pros and cons for you personally. Some people, might not want that control you might not have the time to do everything the marketing and all of that um other people might love that and really relish it some people as i've said how their dream will be to see their book on a bookshelf um the best chance of that is maybe another option than self-publishing although actually you can still get an agent if you self-published and then they can sell your rights in other territories too so you could get a shelf but the, the opportunity is endless but what I really want to try and do this is such a quick overview and I'm, I know I'm going to be here forever talking so I'm sorry everyone is what I'm trying to get across is really do your research and look up everything you can before you make your decisions on which path you want to go through um oh Louise they're called books covered uh we can put we'll I can write that down afterwards as well um next slide uh yes so these are just examples of each of the models um books that have done phenomenally well nicola may self-publishing um as i've said already just incredible job eleanor oliphant is an Im immense example of a traditionally published book it really was the whole team getting behind that book all that experience um 
and it's been phenomenal. Um, the Secret Orphan by Glynis Peters has done, she's published with one more chapter. So obviously I'm biased, but genuinely, like I'm so pleased, like USA Today bestseller, uh, huge ebook bestseller here in the UK, a Canadian bestseller in physical and trade paperback. Um, so she's a bestseller in digital and in physical formats as well and then Soraya M Lane who if you haven't read her books they are wonderful um is an Amazon uh she's with an Amazon imprint and again does amazingly well um so those are just examples of the different types of models um now what are you going to write so my point with this slide one of the things I was also thinking about is people are always authors tend to ask like there can be conflicting advice. You have to write what you love, write what you know, but then you'll also get rejections from people like me who are like, oh, I'm sorry, this is really difficult to publish right now, this genre. Um, so I'm afraid we can't accept it. Although again, I would say on genres, self-publishing is also a way of finding those more niche readers and audiences so it's really interesting to see and especially on kindle and limited now and how popular that's growing what genres are working to if you say of publishing you know if when i've tried to publish um you know paranormal had its moment around kind of like twilight it was hugely successful um and then for a couple of years it was really difficult to publish paranormal except in the self-publishing market readers were finding their paranormal books and loving them um so it is you know i would again say there's that you can reach it's all about how you reach your readers and there will be some models that are, e are able to reach the harder you know the smaller and more niche uh areas than others um, but yeah, what are you going to write? So what do you what do you love? Um, but also what do readers love? So the next side is definitely more targeted at romance. Um, <laughs> this has changed a bit, I think, in the last year. So the other thing is, because this was, as I said, tailored for RNA. Um, and I'm sure a lot of us kept hearing that romance is dead. And it would be like newsflash, someone's publishing a romance book or a rom-com or and actually the thing is we've had these you know these books have been around for years and years and years and people have always been reading them and always been loving them so this this part of the presentation is really about my like championing romance how awesome it is and how um just like brilliant and I get so frustrated I think you can see my little Twitter rants there like the Guardian books having a category for every genre apart from romance like that's just not on there are so many women and men readers who love these books and they deserve their place um and it isn't dead so yes the market trends at the moment a lot is focused on crime and thriller uh, psychological suspense. I think, you know, Gone Girl really blew that genre out of the water and there's amazing books being published and still being published and still really popular. But actually you're seeing, I'm seeing as well in the charts, more of the, um, well, people call it uplit now, but more feel good fiction coming through. And especially during, I think, like times at the moment where you just need a bit of escapism and a bit of joy so romance is not dead so if you want to write romance write romance um and then i these are some examples of romance books at the top of the charts again just bear in mind this is last year one day in december incredible did so well josie silver the tattoo of, of auschwitz it's historical but yes uh, it had a love story and that has just done phenomenally well again Lorna Cook's The Forgotten Village a oh, brilliant book that was at the top of the charts and Sophie Reynolds hilarious sorry not sorry and I think it'd been a few years of very kind of uh, crime and thriller heavy <laughs> um, charts and then we're seeing we're seeing these ones break through which is fantastic 
Um, so, uh, and one of these reasons I think is Netflix really pushed the way, pushed forward with their rom com. So they released this Summer of Love, um, and I think we all watched like To All the Boys I Love Before, um, The Kissing Booth. They've just, and in fact, they've even got more rom com. I can't keep up with the rom coms there. They're they're showing on their chat like on the site. It's incredible. And I think people were kind of reminded, I felt last summer, this is when I gave this presentation, that there was a kind of a feeling of like, oh my God, do you remember like 10 things I hate about you and how good that was? And they were like, yeah, I've watched to all the boys I've loved before because that reminds the same. And oh, I just want to read something like, oh, I love this. And you know, it really kind of, I do feel um that's kind of helped set the way and then also just the times at the moment and but really as I've said already the readers you guys um there's always been readers there's all reading romance there's usually a romance in every book there's always a bit of love whatever there are many forms of love as there are moments in time I think that's from a Jane Austen film um but yes yeah, so this is my like passionate championing of the genre for the RNA. And Georgia Hill says we really need a feel good. Oh, I've lost it now. Sorry, Georgia. But I was going to say I agree exactly. Um, so the other flip side when you're thinking about what you're going to write um, is who you're writing for. So you're thinking about what you want to write and then just bear in mind the areas and the different models of publishing and what people we're, what publishers are looking for but then the other the other side is um it's not you it's your reader so really thinking about who is going to read your book because they might not have the same likes and tastes as you they might not be like you um they might not be like it, it's just a way of thinking every book i so every book i publish Yes, I personally have to like it. I have to keep turning the page. But I'm not really thinking about myself. I'm thinking, right, who is buying books right now? How old are they? What's, you know, are they men, women? Where do they live? What area? What do they like? What are they watching on TV? What are they listening to? What are they, what are their hobbies? Um, like, it's really important to think who like I we kind of have like a reader in your head and think what would you know she could be called Karen or Derry or something would be like what would Karen like is Karen gonna like this and that's kind of what makes commercial fiction commercial because you want to reach the widest possible readership so it can be hard to like we sort of advise against narrowing your or targeting specific um although targeting that sounds because we do target readerships but we we're all, basically what i'm trying to say is very badly <laughs> we we really want to target the widest possible readership um and that's what makes um like that's what makes com that's what what that's what commercial publishing is. Um, so yes, you could really love one example I do give to authors, and again, this isn't um, this isn't something. Don't generalize this at all. But one example I give is like oh, if, like things like tattoos on your main characters are really divisive. Some people absolutely hate tattoos. Other people love them. Oh, Sarah, broad appeal. Yes. Thank you. George, I actually think you should probably be doing this. Um, you need a broad appeal. So some people really hate tattoos. Some people really love them. If they're reading a character with tattoos, then they could be put off because they'll be like, oh, God, I hate tattoos. And they won't pick up your book or they'll stop reading. It's, just, it's kind of I'm not saying you can't write a character with tattoos. That's not true. You absolutely can. This is a very generalized example, but it's kind of thinking in that way. Of just being aware of um, just being aware of all the different readers and what they're you know what they like, and then also think about what genre you're writing into, and who is who is reading those uh, books. So um, that's kind of what I'm trying to get out with. It's not you, it's your reader, and then moving on. 
the next slide. Oh, trends. Okay, so everybody in publishing wants to find the next big trend. This is an example um, of, sorry, I should stop reading the comments because they're making me laugh and putting me off. Um, it's really, it, anyway, uh, <laughs> I just saw and beards. Uh, We'll talk about that afterwards. Um, so the trend word is it trends are very hard to predict. And this goes back to like writing what you love and writing what you know versus writing what the market wants and maybe what the readers want. And everybody's always trying to predict the next trend. My tip here was um, this is an example of Julie Kaplan's Cafe in Copenhagen book, um, which partly it basically came from looking at what was working in nonfiction. Oh, we've also got Rosie Blake's The Hookah Holiday, which is a wonderful book, by the way. Um, I didn't publish that, so I don't know what the thinking was behind that. But with Julie's book, it was Hugo has become such a talking point in society. Can we take that nonfiction lifestyle conversation and put it in a fiction book? And actually, I think we've seen, I mean, Cafe in Copenhagen has done amazingly. And more than that the reviews people were saying oh i loved learning about like it, it they loved learning about huga through it but they also loved thinking about their own lifestyles changing their own lifestyles going to denmark why the danes were so happy um and a, a good thing to do is kind of look at non what's happening what books are being published in non-fiction and then also what are people talking about in wider society so again, I think an example like Eleanor Oliphant hit at the perfect time where people were being open about feeling lonely and paying more emphasis on kindness and just checking in with your neighbours. And in the book, that's exactly, you know, she's, she's a really lonely person. She doesn't have many people in her life. And I think that's still going on now. And a lot of books with wonderful older characters, um, because, you know, we're talking about how we can look after our elders, like social care, like all these really like important conversations are going on um, that we're having ourselves, that we're having with our neighbours, our families, our friends. And if you see any, if you see those issues being dealt with in a fiction book, you relate just that little bit more. Um, and you can look and think, oh, that's what I'm going through, or that's how I feel, or, you know, that's, yes, that's what I've been thinking about. Um, and I think that can really help with people loving and reading your book. They just, there's that little bit more engagement or, you know, relatability is what I'm trying to say. But please don't get like too hung up on the trend, on trends. Um, you can try and look ahead, but none of us have a crystal ball. I don't think any of us would have predicted this year. Um, but if you want to, if you want to think about it, have a look at, I definitely recommend nonfiction. Um, wow, we are coming up to an hour, guys. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you for bearing with me. <laughs> um, oh, and then this one is... Uh, something I talk to authors about a lot patience is a virtue so this is an example of the amazing Jojo Moyes um if you haven't read any of these books before me before you you definitely have to because they're all incredible each and every one but basically that was you know me before you was her big breakup book but look how many books she'd written before that so please bear in mind it is very 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 rare to get your first, to make your first book a huge hit. And don't like, don't give up, don't despair. It can take a long time. Um, but just be aware it's not an overnight thing all the time. So yeah, and if you're feeling crap and you think, God, my first book hasn't worked, my second book hasn't worked, you know, actually remember Jojo Moyes and look at the books she had before like I'm not saying they didn't have success they did have success but her really her breakout book was me before you so just remember that um and then next oh okay we're wow we're at the end I feel like I've, there's so much more I should cover um so this is the time for questions thank you for listening amazing uh, thank you 
so, so much, everyone, for joining us today and for all your absolutely brilliant questions. I'm sorry that we've had to kind of end it there, but it has been, you know, it's just Charlotte did such an amazing presentation and I think it was really just so much useful content. So I hope you um, all enjoyed it. And as I mentioned before, if you know you would like to hear from us again any in any sort of more specific topics, um, just let us know and we can definitely do that. Um, and yeah, we really hope that you also not only found it useful, but also inspiring um, because there are just so many brilliant stories out there and we just want more people. Uh, we just want to we just want to share them. So please do submit to us. Um, we'll post again our 